All right. Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, this is going to be our opening song this morning, and uh, we're going to read a little scripture before we sing it. I just believe he's a little extra special good for us. I believe he's special good. 
I want to tell you all something. You are here right in the midst of a revival, right in the midst of God pouring His Spirit down in this place. And uh, there's nothing better, nothing greater than what we're experiencing as a church right now. And I just want to welcome you here. If you've been here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're new this morning, welcome to one of the greatest experiences of your life as you see God move. And I'm excited about seeing that today. I want to tell you God's affirmation, God's, God's uh, just, just all the time just, just saying, I've got you, I've got this, I, I, I'm, I'm here. And uh, this week I was, uh, Jacqueline's car had a recall and it's been gone for four weeks in the shop, so we've been down to one vehicle. And we went to pick it up this week. And the guy that drove the car out um, to give it to me, he looked at me and he said, you're a man of God, aren't you? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, I am. He said, well, I got a word for you from the Lord. I said, okay. He said, it's for your church. He said, go and tell your church to weed out their spiritual garden because God has blessings he wants to pour out. So church, weed out the spiritual garden this morning. Let's weed it out and watch God's blessings fall. Father God, Lord, that's our desire today. Lord, that you would let your blessings fall. But God, in the midst of that, give us conviction, discernment, and wisdom, Lord. Give us a work of the Spirit that shows us what to weed out, Lord. Lord, to cast off the darkness, Lord, and the ways we may walk in the works of darkness and put on Christ today. And Lord, as you do that, May we experience your blessings and more than we could imagine in a way more than we can imagine with your riches and your glory and your honor and that we just humble ourselves before you, King Jesus. We love you, Lord, and it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. All right, well, our, we've kind of been studying a lesson that talks about the, when you pick the songs, of course, we pray about the songs that we sing, but when you pick them, you got to have the scripture to go with them. So uh, we're trying to read the scripture before every song that we sing, and we're going to let Megan take over. In Psalms 30, 10 through 12, it says, Lord, listen and be gracious to me. Lord, be my helper. You turn my lament into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with goodness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise you forever. Amen. Let's praise Jesus this morning in the graves of the garden. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures in vain. Never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied. I'm here in your love. Better than you, oh, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. Show you my weakness, of my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain, He's the God of the valley too. Is the God of the valley? There's not a place. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is. Oh, there's nothing 
vida. I found, guys, there's nothing better. I see it already, God. Just, we just open it up to you today, God. Lord, there's nothing better than you. Lord, uh, all the things that you've done, just like turning the bones into armies. God, uh, God, you're mighty. You're moving in a mighty way, Lord. And uh, We just offer the service up to you this morning, Lord. We're going to sing the last chorus. Romans 14 4 he is able to make you stand Romans 16 25 he's able to establish you Jude 24 he's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his glory and then Sebastian say like this one Ephesians 3 20 he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think so the point of that is that our God is able to do anything, so let's sing about him. If you need to say it, you can say it.
anniversary song. So if you've had a birthday or anniversary, you can come up. Y'all can be seated if you like. Now look, I ain't got a lot of air, so I see you over there doing this already. So just calm down. Here we go. Okay, do your thing. How young? Uh, 34. 34. 34 Utah? Goodness, boy. God's good, ain't he? A day apart. 24 hours. Ain't well, nothing to, to see who's older. Well, no, not really. They're just talking about how they was. <laughs> one day older than another one, that's all. <laughs> we better sing. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you both, happy birthday to you. All right. Brother David, would you listen to prayer, please? and help us always to keep our eyes on you and follow you. And Lord, bless this offering that we're about to receive and show us how to use it and bring the greatest honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome to Friendship Baptist Church. Let's check the announcements. Join us on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. Write down any questions you might have as you read through our Bible reading plan. What a great blessing to grow in the Lord and with other believers. Join us on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. in His presence. On Sunday nights, we have two focuses. One, find His presence, and two, stay there. Come join us in these special services as we seek the Lord together. Deacon nominee, please be in prayer for these deacon nominees for the next six weeks. During the next six weeks, we will hear the testimony from each of them. Praise the Lord for His movement. The church will vote on May 1st for all or none of these nominees. Ralph Bennett, David Pierce, Dwayne Neal, and Michael Bowling. April 6th, egg packing party at 6.30 p.m. In replacement of Wednesday night disciples fire services. Mark your calendars to come help us pack our Easter eggs. April 8th, community Easter egg hunt and glowing Easter celebration at 6 p.m. April 9th. Main breakfast. Come grab some food while you share what God's doing in your life. Livestock show. We are collecting money to purchase a steer from the livestock show again this year. This is an awesome opportunity for our church to support the kids in the Anderson County Livestock Show. 
This meet is a way our church is a blessing for families during funeral, sickness, and many outreach ministries within our church. Please consider giving to this. This will be purchased on April 14th. April 15th, Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. April 17th, Easter service schedule. Easter sunrise at 6.45 a.m. with a breakfast to follow. Easter prayer at 9.45 a.m. Come pray for our Easter services. Easter worship service at 10.45 a.m. note on Wednesday when we have the egg packing party all y'all are invited every age it's always a blessing to see every age sitting there across the table putting it, um, candy in these eggs and so we got like 6,000 so that's a uh, we need lots of hands and so if you can help it'd be a blessing there'll be pizza provided at 6 p.m. so if you want to come a little early get some pizza and uh, enjoy some fellowship that way too so there's that you can bring more candy if you'd like to do that of course we'll always take more candy and so um, you can bring that Wednesday with you even um, another thing is we have the Experiencing God study, and I saw a couple names on that back there, but I want to just share something with you. That Experiencing God, April 1st, so two days ago, they just released an update to it. And so they revised um, it all. The, the, the book itself is pretty similar, but the videos are completely different, and they're all updated. And so I'm very excited about that, that study. And so um, get with Devin if you have any questions, and uh, he'll, he's going to help us out with leading that. And then also um, uh, there's a there's a page on the back back there to sign your name up. I need all my youngins. Can y'all come forward? All my fifth grade and under. Can y'all walk up here for me, please? I need your help. I've been losing sleep over something. Hey, buddy. Hey. Hey. Hey, McKenna. It was a very fast walking feat, Sadie. All right, guys, I got a question for y'all. Go ahead, go ahead, take a seat, take a seat. All right, y'all look up at me. Have y'all ever been woke up in the morning? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You get really grumpy at your mom? Yeah. Bud. Grumpy at my and you, <laughs> you get really grumpy at your brother. Help me out, because cause I'm having problems with getting some people, the ladies in my life, to wake up in the morning. So I want to know what it is that wakes y'all up. So tell me what wakes you up in the morning. Your daddy's voice. He's very annoying. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Easy. Hey. Okay, Trip. You're raising your hand. Puts ice on your back. We're going to have to have a discussion about that, Trip. Okay. Okay. The lights. It's like, oh, I saw the light. Right? Mm -hmm. You know about that? Yes, sweetie. He screams at night, wakes you up. Well, my little uh, daughter screams all night long, so I understand that. I understand that. Go ahead, Samuel. You can roar really loud? Show me how to do it. Oh, man, that's a scary way to wake up. All right, you hear that, all yet? Tomorrow morning, I'm going to come in and go, oh. Maybe so. All right, last one here. So the animals come up, the pets, yeah. All right, I said last one. Jameson, come on, buddy, one more. Oh, no, the dog <laughs> pees. That's a terrible morning. Oh, that's terrible. What about a rooster? Does anybody have roosters? Yeah, what does a rooster sound make? Okay, 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 okay. Everybody look at me. My point is, is y'all can all wake up to different things. In our Bible story today, in our Bible story... And, and as, as Paul's giving us what he gives us in, in Romans 13, at the end of it, he says something very um, important. Look at me. Look at me, Sam, 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 Sam. Look at me. Look at me. He says something very important. I want you all to hear this. He says this. He says, the time to wake up is now. The day's approaching. Wake up. Stop sleeping. What he means by that is there's some really serious stuff about God going on. And he says, we're paying attention to all this other stuff. He says, wake up. So can y'all wake up with me? Can y'all pray that God would help us wake up, help us as a church wake up to what he has for us, that God would wake us up? That'd be the best way to wake up, wouldn't it, if God wakes us up? And so let's pray. Dear Jesus, help us wake up to see you. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. All right, kindergarten under, you can go back for Children's Church. Check one, two. Isn't that a beautiful sound, guys? It's a beautiful sound here, and then we'll go out. Um, last week, y'all heard from Dwayne Neal, uh, one of the Deacon nominees. This week, Michael Boland's going to come and share with y'all. And I just love Michael. If you've met Michael, if you've been around Michael, you just know um, the Lord's all over him. And the Lord especially right now is all over him. And so I'm going to give him an opportunity to share before he steals this thing out of my hand. Thank you. <laughs> it's a great honor and with humility and humble I stand here before you today. But enough of you have put my name recommended me to be a, I don't like titles, but it's a deacon. I don't, I'm a servant of God, and I prefer to be called a servant of God. Thank you. Uh, beside my name on the church roll, to get it up here. There you go, there you go. <laughs> you know, a lot of people, it says the day you were baptized. Mine says statement, and I feel like you ought to know what statement is. Okay. I was born of a mother that was baptized in the Baptist church and a father that was baptized in the church of Christ and my grandfather was a deacon in the Baptist church I've traveled to many a road I've seen both faiths and both doctors. they're similar in that uh, both believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ okay uh, my father was killed in a wreck when I was 11 years old we were attending Crescent Heights Church of Christ in Tyler. And Don Anders was the uh, pastor there. I stayed at his house as much as I did. My mother was busy flipping hamburgers and going to school, trying to make a living. Don raised me. My grandfather raised me. I stayed with him in the summer and I attended the Baptist Church. We went to Piney Woods Encampment. I was 12 years old. I think it was 1962. I'm old and I'm not good with dates. But as many of our children knew, we went there and we rejoiced in the Lord and we glorified him. And I came home with a fire in my heart. And that Sunday, Don preached Revelations 14 through 20. It's a letter and a speech for God to the Ladotian church that you were neither hot nor cold and you were lukewarm and I spew you out of my mouth. Down in chapter, not chapter, verse 20 says, I stand and I knock. If any man answereth, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. And I knew who my Savior was in my heart. I love the Lord thy God, my God, with all my heart and all my soul. And I knew that you had to have faith to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It says so in the Bible. And that if you'd ask on uh, Jesus Christ, call on his name, that by grace through faith that you could be saved. Now, there's a lot of preachings on baptism. There was a difference in the Church of Christ that's different in the Baptist. It, uh, Church of Christ believes you got to be baptized, that that's completion of your salvation. If it was, that would be works, and you can never be saved by works. Only through obedience, acceptance to God, following him and his example. When he went to John to fulfill all righteousness. It also says, arise and be baptized, wash away thy sins. It says, go throughout the world, making disciples and baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost but I elected to stand on Baptist doctrine. Even though I was baptized by Jay Lockhart at Glenwood Baptist Church, I went to him after that and I explained what had happened to me when I was young. I'd made my profession, but age of accountability came into it with them. And I sought that, I read. You know, the Jewish faith says you're 13, you're a man. In the Bible, there's a place where it says you were 20, you could only serve in the Lord's ordinances and so forth. But I knew good from evil. I know good from evil this day. And, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? 
nothing but the blood of Christ, believe in God. You can be baptized as many times as you want to, but if you don't have that salvation in your heart, if he's not in your heart, and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, it's nothing more than just water. I failed in my walk on several occasions. I've talked with Doyle. We discussed this the other day. You know, when his father died, he argued against God. My mother fell down the steps, church, died. I argued with God. But it says, who am I that is formed to reply against he that formed me? And I worked through that. Another failure that I felt like I've had Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Lean not on thy own understanding, but seekest the Lord's way, and he'll make your pathway straight. Be not wise in your own eyes, and shun evil. This church right now is the most unified I've ever seen it. There's revival here, each and every one of you. You are the bride of Christ. And if you so choose, I'd be honored to be your servant also. Because I promise God, this building program was not unified when it started. It voted three times. It was voted down twice. The third time we voted, Jack Thornton said, why are we voting again? Well, some of the people felt it was the will of God and it passed. I had mixed emotions because of that. I didn't seek God and ask him his will. I went to Jack Thornton to talk to him. I went to two or three other deacons who weren't for this. And I pulled a Jonah. There was a job that came open in Huntsville. There was another ring. I was pretty proud, pretty ambitious. And I reached up and grabbed that ring and I ran. Well, I sat there for about three and a half years. And I was sitting in the office and I was tired, I was worried. It took a toll on my spiritual life, on my marriage. And I asked God what to do. He says, you need to go home. So I came home. The second greatest gift that God's ever given me is my wife that I love. And she must have the patience of Job. <laughs> and I know she loves me unconditionally, just like God does. You know, we're all human, we're fallible, I've erred. You say you're without sin, you lie. You make God a liar because all born in sin. When I came back, Dad managed to cut this hill, pour a slab, and there's a big empty shell here. I went over and I walked in it one day, and I prayed to God, "Is this your will? It's bound to be because it's gotten this far." And He slapped me and told me to get up and go to work and to never question him again. I promised him as long as I drew a breath that I'd be his servant and do his will. And I would follow what Proverbs 5 through said, I would seek his discernment and look not on my own ways and do not be wise in your own eyes. And that's kind of important to me because God assembled a team team built this church. God built this church. Not a man. It was only through his will. When we came in here to work, work material. Skip Whitwell drug out this old level and he gave it to me later. He bought him a new one. And what was written? <laughs> you can believe in coincidence. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7 was written on the bottom of it. And I believe that that was God you know, telling me again. That's written on a board right up under there. Amen. Over the door where you go into the offices, your office, is Hebrews 11, 1, it's faith. You can't please God without faith. What is faith? Substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things unseen. And I can tell you right now, hey, if you don't have your heart right, you can be baptized 14, you'll never work your way in. Skip couldn't drive enough nails. I couldn't hang enough fixtures, twist enough wires. Roy couldn't take enough measurements. AT couldn't make enough cuts. You can't work your way into heaven. 
That's my statement. I'm humbled that you so vote, but I ask you to go home and read Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Look to God. Look not to your own understanding. Pray. And it gives me pleasure in my heart to say, God's way, God's will, always. I thank you for hearing me out. And I humbly submit myself to you that I'll be your servant. Amen. Love you, brother. Praise the Lord. Um, I hope that testimony just, just uh, was used by the Lord to, to even strengthen your own faith and challenge yourself and your own heart. And so I'm going to ask, we don't ever do this, but um, as they're going to sing this song, um, we're going to have an invitation here before we even preach. And uh, I want you to come to the altar and, and, and seek the Lord. Not your own understanding. Seek the Lord. Come to the altar and say, God, I want your will and whatever's going on in my life. Maybe you're in here today and just as he said, you, you, you've struggled with your own salvation because, because you're trying to work your way there. And maybe the Lord just revealed to you it's not works. It's faith. Turn from yourself. Turn to him. I'm up here. I'm going to stand up here. Let's have a time of, of, of calling unto the Lord.
God, Lord, you are moving and your spirit is here, God. Lord, through testimony, through, through song of, of scripture, Lord. Lord, you're moving and you're saving hearts today, God. Lord, you're taking people from death to life today, God. Lord, would you continue to move, Lord? Lord, this is your service. This is your place, God, to do what you desire. And Lord, I know there are others in here that are sitting right in this place right now. Lord, that are saying, I don't know. I'm struggling, and, 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 and I, I don't know what that looks like. And so, Lord, help us counsel them and walk through that with them. But, Lord, I know there are also others that you are clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, calling today, God. Lord, from death to life, they are saying, I've tried, I've tried, and I've failed. And I'm tired of trying. I repent. I turn from my understanding, my ways. And I trust you today, God. I put my faith in you today, God, only by your grace and your goodness. And so, Lord, call them to that place. And may they share and testify and rejoice with their church, God. Lord, there's others in here that may have been saved and walking through this process of of, of, of trying to understand that and, and grow in that, Lord, that sanctification of transformation happening, Lord. And you've revealed to them that that. Lord, that they need to be baptized as an act of of obedience, walking them. Lord, the salvation has already occurred and you've given them assurance of that, but they want to walk with their church in obedience. So God called them to that. Lord, more than anything, you move your spirit right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Church, we got a day to celebrate today. <laughs> Miss Sue and Don Tuttle, we had a conversation on Wednesday night of just walking through, and, and Miss Sue started that by saying, My eyes have been opened. 
through reading the scripture, they spent the last six years going through the Bible together. Isn't that awesome? And in that time, God has been opening her eyes. She's been a secretary of a church. She's been faithful in, in, in the church all of her life. And she said, God's opening my eyes, though, to something that's different here. And so she wants to tell you, church, that she's been saved and she wants to get baptized. And as I walked through that with her and by the Lord's grace in the midst of that, they went home and talked through it. And Don said, you know what? My heart too. And so I want to walk this with you. And I want to give my life to Christ and know that I have assurance of salvation and get baptized too. Guys. Adam, I love you, brother. <laughs> I've been walking through this the last couple years with you, kind of just walking through and struggling and you're in that. And, and today, listen to me, you don't even know this. Today, David came up to me. So will you pray for Adam? Today, this morning, will you pray for Adam? That he would get peace in his heart. And brother, I pray, we pray. And here you are this morning telling your church, I want a new heart in Christ. I want to give my life to Christ by grace, through faith only. So church, I don't know how many baptisms that is coming up on Easter Sunday, but it's going to be an exciting day, y'all. It's going to be an exciting day. God is good. May He continue to work through this service today. Y'all can go back to your normal seats, set there, whatever y'all want to do. Father God, Lord, we give you all glory today, God. We give you all credit for what's going on. Lord, we know that this is a spiritual movement. It's not a movement of our church. It's not a movement of the pastor. It's not a movement of, of the people that are singing. It's not a movement of, of, of any of us outside of the Spirit of God within us calling us to You, Lord. And so, God, would You continue to move? Continue to move. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can hold off on that video. I'm not even going to show it, Lisa. Not that first one. Oh, God is so good, guys. He's so good. We are in Romans. And I want you to get your Bibles. I want you to go to Romans as if you've never opened up your Bibles before. I want you to pick up wherever it is that we're at today, which is Romans 13. And I want you to come to the Scripture today with an open heart to say, God, open my eyes to you. And as I, I'm saying that, you're going to think, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? This passage, have all passages that you could preach today. We just experienced the movement of God, y'all. And you say, this passage is where the Lord is leading us? It may confuse you as it's confused me this week. But I want you to hear this morning God's word. I don't, wanna, I don't want us to miss what he has for us. This is the passage where God talks about subjecting ourselves to the government. And about paying taxes. <laughs> You mean God's going to save people with a message that's talking about paying taxes and surrendering to the government? Guys, it has to be a miraculous movement of God. Here we are, though, and I've struggled all week long with this passage. I've struggled. God, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed to the Lord. God, you know we're in a revival right now. You know you're spiritually awakening your people right now. I know you know this because you are doing it. And so, God, why Romans 13? I've looked at the things going on in our government just this past week, and, and I've thought to myself, God, you know what's going on in our government this past week. Why Romans 13 this week? Why this week? Why not a Zacchaeus passage where salvation comes to his house, or an Ethiopian eunuch where he gets saved and baptized? Why not one of those passages, Lord? And it was in this time that the Lord altered my heart, and he has a word for every one of us today. He has a word for you today, and I want you to hear it <laughs> in our nation's darkest times. God has some reminders for us. I want to walk through this with you. The first reminder is America is still under God's sovereign authority and is appointed by God. I want you all to hear me. America is still under God's sovereign authority and appointed by God. Look at Romans 13, 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. And you might say, like I said, are you sure? God, are you sure? 
We're supposed to submit and surrender and subject ourselves to the government in this sense. Subject yourselves to the authority that is given by the authority of God. And you say, Pastor, have you seen what's going on in our nation? Have you seen what's going on in our nation? I want to know if you all have seen what I've been seeing. Will you watch this video? We are submissive citizens of a government. We are to... Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. Which passages of scripture should guide our public policy? Should we go with uh, Leviticus, which uh, suggests slavery is okay, and that eating uh, shellfish is an abomination? Or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy, which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith? Or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount, a passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application? You shut up, man. Listen, in okay. China ate your lunch, Joe. And You're the, the worst way, president in America has ever had. Hey, hey, Come Joe, on. Me, I'm not here to call out his lies. Everybody knows he's a liar. But you I just agree. want to hey, make sure. Joe, the I, 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 I want to make sure. You graduated last in your class, I, not first in your I, class. I, I, <laughs> Absolutely you're, wait, not stop. true. You're doing it. You're going to have tape. true. Gentlemen, is, <laughs> I hate to raise my voice, but I see it seems to be. Why shouldn't I be different than the two of you? With her victory in the women's 500-yard freestyle, Leah Thomas is now the first openly transgender D1 athlete to become an NCAA national champion. Uh, can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? Not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. We all know about America's rising crime rate, especially violent crime in urban areas. But did you know that an increasing number of these depraved acts are being committed by young teens? Illinois Elementary School is offering an after-school Satan Club. The local school district is defending the Satan Club. It's sponsored by the Satanic Temple of the United States. The club claims it will help kids learn benevolence and empathy as well as, quote, personal sovereignty. If you're any transgender American who's struggling, please know you're not alone. To parents and children alike, please ask for help and know this. You're so brave, you belong, and we have your back. God bless you all. Be brave. Let me get to this issue uh, that has bothered me and bothered many other people. And that is in the piece that I referred to that you wrote for a publication called Resurgent. You wrote, Muslim, quote, Muslims do not simply have a deficient theology. They do not know God because they have rejected Jesus Christ, his son, and they stand condemned. I don't know how many Muslims there are in America. I really don't know. Probably a couple of million. Are you suggesting that all of those people stand condemned? What about Jews? They stand condemned too? Senator, I'm a Christian. I, I understand you are a Christian, but this country is made up of people who are not just. I understand that Christianity is the majority religion. But there are other people who have different religions in this country and around the world. In your judgment, do you think that people who are not Christians are going to be condemned? Thank you for probing on that question. As a Christian, I believe that all individuals are made in the image of God and are worthy of dignity and respect regardless of their religious beliefs. I believe that, that as a Christian, that's how I should treat all individuals. And do you think your statement that you put into that publication they do not know God because they've rejected Jesus Christ the Son and they stand condemned. Do you think that's respectful of other religions? Senator, I wrote a post based on being a Christian and attending a Christian school that has a statement of faith that speaks clearly with regard to the centrality of Jesus Christ in salvation. I would simply say, Mr. Chairman, that this nominee um, is really not someone who is what this country is supposed to be about. I will vote no. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to 
to my colleagues on the Senate committee. I hope that we are not questioning the faith of others and how they interpret their faith to themselves. Thank you for your willingness to serve our country. I think that the rules should reflect our values as an institution that is the most inclusive as possible, that reflects the gorgeous mosaic in every possible way of the American people. Peace even in this chamber, now and evermore. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. A man and a woman. Just watching that, I'm not pushing a political agenda. I'm showing you God's spiritual agenda and our rebellion against Him. As I watch that, I'm moved to anger, to disturbed. I feel disturbed when I watch that. I feel dread for the direction of our country. And, and I'll walk through that and you say, why are we watching that? We see that all Monday through Saturday. Guys, just because we're here on Sunday doesn't mean we're exempt from what's going on in the world. Amen. But I want to say again to you, America is still under God's sovereign authority and appointed by God. How can you say that? That's what the scripture says. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists, resists the ordinance of God, it says. And I read that and I think, okay, well, maybe that's just the good governments. No. Paul's writing this to the Roman government in which Nero was in charge, which would burn Christians as lamp street lights. And he's telling them to subject themselves into that government. I think about another government where, where there's a census to be made and, and, and there was a young man and a young woman who was pregnant that moved from, from the Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem by their civil obedience so that prophecy would be fulfilled as the mess messianic king would be born. I think of another government where there was a beaten man who had a crown of thorns with blood dripping down his face wearing a purple robe, and as he stood there, the political figure, the political official, looked at him and said, do you not understand I have authority to crucify you and I have the authority to release you? Amen. And that man, who was Jesus, looked at Pilate and said, there are three things, there's order, there's purpose, and there's duties. In each of those institutions, with the government, he explains what those are here. He explains the order is that we are an authority, the governing authority under the authority of God, and we subject ourselves in that authority. That's the order. The purpose comes in verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise for the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he who does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. The purpose here for this ordinance called government is for our good. Don't miss that, guys. We live in a place where it's so easy to jump on the bandwagon of complaining and struggling. As I watch what I just watched with you, my heart burdens. But remember, there's a purpose for government. It says to minister, God's minister to you for good. What does that mean? Well, it's good for us because it teaches us how to be subordinate. It teaches us how to understand authority. For if we, we talk about we don't like subordination, we're prideful people, but we sure want our kids to subordinate themselves to their parents. We sure want students to be subordinate to teachers. We want employees to be subordinate to their boss. There's a reason that subordination is a thing. It's God's design so that things can work. And there's a purpose in that. And it's for our good so that we can understand authority. For without authority, how do we understand God's authority over us? I think Jesus was more concerned about humility and self-denial than our civil liberties. He wasn't about walking the life to change the social order. He was about changing a spiritual order. I want us to align our priorities today. Why else is it good? Because the Lord restrains evil, it tells us. 
You'll hear that government doesn't have the right to force people to do anything, but that's not true. If you take the right to force out of it, then you have a government that can't govern. Government is is legalized force. Could you imagine a place, just a moment, a land without law? No 911. People could do whatever they want without any ramifications. A, a, A place like us, where right in our backyard we have prisons filled with inmates that would just run wild. Could you imagine a place without law? Law is a good thing. It recognizes a moral law. We say murder is wrong, stealing is wrong. It recognizes a a higher moral law there. Government is for our good. It's the purpose. Finally, we have our duties. Look at verse 5 with me. If you're there, say amen. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of the wrath, but also for the conscious sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For there are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another fulfills the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, shall not murder, shall not steal, shall not bear false witness, shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in saying this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So he says you have two duties. Render to what it is owed them, whether that's taxes, customs, fear, honor. Jesus even said something about that. Render to Caesar's what is Caesar's. Render to God's what is God's. But then the other thing is to love. Love one another. It fulfills all the law, it says. So our government is under God's sovereign authority, under his appointment, and it's for our good. But I know there's questions begging that you're wanting to ask. Like, in light of Romans 13, is disobedience to government ever okay? If disobedience is okay, what does that look like? And, And that comes to the second point here. And I want you to hear this loud and clear. We are to obey our government unless it requires us to disobey God. We are to obey our government unless it is to make us disobey God. And this would...
would be so applicable if we lived in North Korea or if we lived in any Islamic state or if we lived in China. All of this would be very applicable every day. But I'm telling you, and I want you to hear me loud and clearly, that this is going to become more and more applicable right here in our states. More and more applicable. Just this last January, just three months ago, Canada passed a law where you're not allowed to counsel someone to, to a different sexual orientation. You're not allowed to counsel them. You know what that does? That means that you are not allowed to speak what the scriptures say about certain subjects. That means in me preaching Romans 1 in January like I did would have been breaking the law in Canada. Hello? You saw Bernie Sanders deny Russell Vault a nominee to be deputy, deputy director of the Office of Management and Budget. There's a job interview and he says you can't serve America because of your centrality on Jesus alone. It's basically what he says. Because you're a Christian and you believe that all others stand condemned apart from Christ, which we have been talking about for the last four months. He says, you are not what this country is really about. May we obey God rather than men. And this is going to have hard implications very soon in our lifetime, I believe. Paul knew this well, though. He would end up being executed under the government in which he's telling them to be subjected to. He'd be beheaded by them. Scripture shows this all throughout. Daniel 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were told to, to bow down to the Nebuchadnezzar image. And they say, no, I don't answer to you. We see it in Daniel 6. With the lions then, they made a decree not to go and pray to anybody but the emperor. And so Daniel goes straight to his house right after he knew it was signed. Opens up the door facing Jerusalem and he says three different times to the Lord. He's praying. Civil disobedience in scripture. It's there. Exodus, the midwives saved Moses when they were told to kill Moses and the rest of the babies. Esther said, I'll go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Acts 5, Peter and John and the rest of the apostles, remember they were, they were preaching Jesus and their government told them not to preach the name of Jesus. And they get in trouble and they get brought back and they said, didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this name? And he says, we ought to obey God rather than men. Wow. All that to say here, church. America is still under God's sovereign authority and appointed by God. However, our obedience to the government should never neglect our obedience to God. And with that reminder, it reminds me of something I want to be real serious with you for a moment with. Since America is still under God's sovereign authority and appointment, it will also be under His judgment. And church, I believe we're already seeing the judgment of God on our nation. And let me just go ahead and say it's Already happening, just like I said. How, how can a nation who has such abundance, with such little thankfulness, with no recognition to God, with no fear to God, expect the blessings of God? I don't believe we can stand much longer in this direction. Now, I want to read some prophecy to you. I'm wrapping this up. But I want you to hear what God has today. Because it's a word for you in the midst of this crazy revival we're going on. He's got this word for you, picked for you. And this is prophecy. Mind it, again, I'm telling you, this is prophecy. I don't know exactly how this will be fulfilled. I don't know if I'm interpreting this right. I don't know exactly what exactly this looks like. It's prophecy. And I'll just go ahead and tell you, brothers and sisters, when you approach prophecy, it'd probably be a good idea to do that yourself. I don't, I don't really know what this looks like. But I want to give you some food for thought here. Revelation 18 and 19 refers to the fall of Babylon the Great. And I want to read some verses to you. Revelation 18 says this. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen. It's fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hate. Drunk the wine of wrath. Of her fornification. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you share and receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. As I want you to hear me, the nations are drinking the wine of wrath of fornication of America. Look at it. 
America who once was known for sending out a beautiful message of the gospel to all nations is now an America that's known as sending out an immoral message that promotes a rebellion against God. They're drinking it up. Revelation 18.9 The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her weep and lament for her for when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. How quickly judgment came. Verse 16 And saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great riches came to nothing. In all of history, there's never been a country more rich than the United States of America. We don't know what poor means anymore. Even the poor folk have iPhones and big screen TVs. It's true. We don't know what poor is. They're such luxury. It's the largest economy in the world. In one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Verse 23, the light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore, shine in you anymore, and the voices of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. It's terrifying. For your merchants were great men of the earth, but your sorcery had all the nations deceived. Great deception today. Chapter 19, and after these things, I heard a loud voice of great multitudes in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. And they walk through this and they say, finally, the marriage supper is here for the lamb and his wife. Right after this, we see the, the fall of great Babylon. Right after that, we see that marriage supper. And again, I say to you, this is prophecy. I don't know if the great Babylon's America. You won't hear that preached very often, but I'm going to tell you something right now. It's terrifying what's going on. I'm not sure, but it looks like it's fitting the bill more and more. But what I do know, and hear me well, America will face judgment eventually, along with every other nation. For there's a time coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess above the name that is above every name, and there will only be one great white throne in which the God himself sits on. So with that reminder today, here's what I want you to hear to close out. Remember our greater citizenship. Remember our greater citizenship. Philippians 3.18 says, For many walk as I have told you about, but I tell you now with even more weeping that there are enemies of the cross of Christ and their end is destruction and their God is their belly and their shame is their glory. Their glory is their shame, it says. But brothers, our citizenship is in heaven who awaits the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies into being conformed to the beautiful, rich body, His body. And it says there after that, my brethren, long awaited, my crown and joy, stand fast in the Lord. My brother and beloved, stand fast in the Paul ends his passage in Romans. There's no greater invitation. You say, why, God, are you having us listen to submitting to the government today when God is obviously up to what he's doing in our church? This is why, for this very reason, I believe it in all my heart because he's calling you to this very passage, Romans 13, 11, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. What word does God have for you today? Wake up. That is his word for you right now. For every one of us, wake up. The night is far spent. The day is here. It's undeniable, guys. The Lord is going to return. The day is here. Wake up. For some of you, that means to wake up from death to life like our brothers and sisters today. 
Maybe He's calling you today to wake up from the spiritual darkness that you've been in, knowing your heart has not been set right. And so during this... And if God's calling you, come on down. Y'all continue to pray there at the altar. I just want to share news with you. Our brother, Aaron Lucius, is, is wanting uh, to let you know that the Lord is in the years of affirmed and assured of salvation, but he wants to be baptized. So he's going to get baptized with us as well. <laughs> Father God, Lord, I lift up Aaron to you, Lord, and I just thank you for, for his willingness to, to see you and to be moved by you today, God. Lord, I lift up Adam to you and his willingness to see you and be moved by you, Lord, and your spirit working the way it has. And the Tuttles, I lift up to you, God, knowing that you are their God. You delivered them, Lord. Thank you for that, God. Lord, I lift up these that are saying that you are their life and their faith is in you and only you. And may we rejoice in this day that baptism is coming. Lord, we rejoice as a church together in celebration of what you have already done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, if he's calling you, don't hold on. This is